Ouais. <rire> S'encène, il y a pas le... Ara mateix, eh? Sí. No. Hola. I és que s'ha entat. Va ser que no, eh? I amb el collador aquest de gallina que portem aquí, eh? que és la, la... <laughs> el micròfon. Sí que se sent, sí. Se sent cap a fora. Sí, sí, sí. Sí. Bé, bon dia. Bon dia. Ara començarem amb la següent ponència. We're going to start with the second uh, panel discussion entitled Open Romanesque Art. Taul 1123. Eva Tarrida, Edward Riu, who's from the Department of Culture, Aloy Maduell and Albert Burzon will be the members of this panel discussion and they will tell us about uh, the project uh, carried out in San Clemente de Taul, a site for Romanesque art in, Romanesque art in Catalonia and uh, the video mapping project that they've done there. Good morning. My name is Eva Tarrida. I'm the architect who, and I've been, I've been fortunate enough as to lead this project funded by uh, the La Casa Social Activities Program in uh, the context of a project called Open Romanesque Art. And one of the things this project has achieved remarkably is to bring together uh, an easy, user-friendly dissemination of knowledge along with, with um, scholarly scholarly knowledge. I'm not sure it's working. The mic is working, says the speaker. Well, San Clemente de Taul. This is a Romanesque church. It's located in the Boi Valley, Boi River Valley. It's uh, been declared a UNESCO heritage site, and its identity landmark is the fact that the apsis of the church has some frescoes. And they have a Christ in majesty painting. And that's the reason why it's best known. This is the image. This identity hallmark was uh, taken out from here in the mid 20th century and uh, then replaced by a copy of reproduction. The project uh, came to us after some archaeological excavations of these uh, main apps after the findings of paintings under the floor. And they called us and at the start, basically, what we had to do was just to fix the floor of the main apse. A little bit later, the Catalan Ministry of Culture decided to replace the copy that was made in the 1950s, uh, which was uh, actually rather well in bad shape, and to introduce a, a global refurbishment of the whole apps, not only the floor, but also having a look at the whole setting. The first analysis that we run there uh, told us that behind this um, eroded copy, there were very uh, valuable remains uh, of uh, the frescoes which had been torn out from the wall in the early 20th century and that's why we were we had the we were lucky enough as to be able to use uh, new technologies for this project because uh, uh, Edward and myself were able to present these uh, extremely relevant findings, all these vestiges of the uh, paintings which had been pulled out all from the wall and the important parts of the apps. Can you please take over? What Eva is explaining somehow is the situation of the Taul Church apps in uh, 2011. That's when we took over the project, and as you can see, 
uh, we had a very torn out and worn out uh, uh, copy of the frescoes. Uh, there have been no innovations for a long time. Uh, we had had some excavations uh, that showed uh, the Romanesque uh, floor, and we had some, uh, well, exploration of the copy of the painting in the apse, and we had the the intuition uh, that uh, there would be some traces of the painting which had been torn out from the from the wall uh, at the time. Uh, actually, the painting had uh, the fresco had been torn out uh, from uh, the church because there were there was a great fear of the painting being sold to the U.S. and that's why it was taken to Barcelona, and uh, that's why then later on, some years later, a copy was placed there. The intervention that we did it was the same one that was done in the 1960s, but um, well improved. We are not inventing anything, and I think that conceptually uh, we need to be honest about this. We're not doing a great, this is not a great innovation from a conceptual point of view, but we are rather taking advantages, uh, advantage of the technologies available at the time. What was the purpose of this whole exercise? We wanted to achieve this. This is the project uh, that we offered, uh, that's the draft of the project. Our first uh, mapping which is what has been done, was uh, just uh, the realization of an idea. We wanted to restore the apps of some Clement de Taul by recovering all the initial, the original complexity of the paintings. This was the uh, raison d'etre of the project. And we, I'll show you how we did it and how we did research about this, because this is a product that didn't stem from nowhere, but it's rather the result of this uh, of, of a laborious amount of work and a long process that we are very happy to present here. Uh, we think uh, that we've had wonderful partners in this project. They really worked well, and I think that this is one of the projects that uh, generates uh, great satisfaction among all of those involved. Uh, it's been extremely, we've been extremely lucky to be able to work on Taul and with the funding conditions uh, provided by La Caixa Social Activities uh, Department and with our our managers, actually, because when the Catalan Ministry of Culture was presented with this, first of all, there was a certain reluctance, uh, and uh, it's understandable. They said, is it safe? Can you do that? Are you sure that there's some paint left behind the current paintings? Because we're taking lots of risks. This kind of mapping has never been done. And our proposal was, uh, well, to do a photographic copy that would be that will cling on the original surfaces. And this, of course, uh, led to a number of, uh, well, well, to certain reluctances. And we were actually uh, uh, working with blind. Uh, this was uncharted territory. And uh, well, you can tell us uh, what you think about that. But we are quite happy about the results. So what did we have to do that? First of all, uh, we had to go back to the documents and get some background information. This is an, a church that was found uh, in the, well, there, there has been documented and reported from the early 20th century. We went back to the old documents uh, to see if we could find out about the original status of the building. This church, in spite of whatever uh, some people may think, is almost like a fossil church. It's almost in the same state as in the 12th uh, century, when in, in 1907 uh, the first uh, reports uh, were written about it, uh, it was almost in the same state as it was in the 12th century. There's a late uh, Gothic um, altarpiece which covered the paintings. The paintings uh, in the apse were always visible, even if they were behind the altarpiece. The paintings uh, were torn out from the walls in 1920 to be taken to Barcelona, and then the apse uh, uh, remained naked. Since uh, from 1920 to 1960, the apse was naked and it was repainted without paying any attention to that. Alejandro Farano was the first restorer of this. Uh, it was The project was paid by the electricity company, the power company in the region. And they made this investment in uh, the Taul church. And they decided to recopy, to make a copy of the painting. It was done by hand based on the pictures that they had about that. But the whole work uh, um, lost uh, lost uh, um, it's uh, 
its color and lots of its conditions and it deteriorated and uh, well, later on uh, more paintings were found in the lower part of the apse uh, the original pavement was also found so uh, this uh, actually rejected some of the theories uh, about the fact that the church had been painted twice we are not going to go into detail but these are things that um, derive from this uh, project these are all topics which have been sorted out after long research and lots of doubts about the issue and it was clear that the church had two decorative stages we decided to go back to the second stage and to to um, to restore that uh, the Christ in majesty uh, why did we do why did we uh, remove uh, the painting of that copy first well because that we had that painting which um, nobody had paid attention to nobody and that's the painting uh, sorry the picture done uh, shortly after the 1920 when these uh, paintings were pulled out and these are the remains of the deeper layer of the frescoes so we had the possibility of thinking we, we realized that behind the physical copy there was a possibility of uh, finding some traces of the original painting the original fresco this was one of the things that uh, this project will recover. We recovered the on-site original painting plus the lost paint uh, thanks, to the, thanks to the mapping project to check the existence of that uh, original painting. Uh, Pera Rubira from the Restoration Center for Mobile Goods, uh, an institution, uh, a conservation institution from the Generalitat de Catalunya, they started doing some work to check the existence of those initial traces. We removed the 1960s uh, copy with a number of problems in the Boi Valley because this, there's another history, another part of this project. It was difficult. It was uh, as all projects, and that's interesting to explain that. There was a reaction of a number of people against this. Uh, the people in the valley felt uh, that they were almost like an orphan if they were to lose a physical copy of the painting that they had uh, there. Uh, we went there several times. We had some meetings with the neighbors. We tried to explain the project and we explained the possibility of offering through mapping much more of a reality asset than through the painting. And after lots of assemblies uh, with the neighbors, uh, the physical copy was removed and we started to restore the deep layers of the painting, as you can see there on the slide. Once we had uh, withdrawn the copy and we had cleaned up the apps uh, from the 1960s uh, copies and well paint uh, we started to see the paint uh, of the deep layers uh, what was uh, to be found there after uh, the fresco had been removed in the 1920s uh, if you light this up and you combine it with the original picture which uh, painting which was remain which remained there and was not pulled out in the 1920s uh, this is the combination that uh, was left there. If uh, would you like to explain how we've done that? This image, in my opinion, is uh, a view of the church, of the overall church, and uh, Eloy was extremely skillful because he was able to project over the whole surface of the church. Uh, and uh, when his time term, when he will have time to explain this, uh, there are six projectors, and now that. Uh, um, back on stage, as we could say, and we have seen that behind the copy, there were extremely valuable uh, traces, and that's why we decided to advocate for their, those remains, those traces to be shown. We didn't want a copy on top of it. We wanted to, to make those traces available to the, to the general public, and we decided that we wanted to to bring what was in the museum in Barcelona, we, to bring it back there. And we, this was a dream. And we have been able to present now what San Clemente de Taul was like in, 11, in 1123. This is a hypothesis of what it was like when it was created in the 19, in the 12th century, but we have been able to recreate the whole main apse of the church. And uh, that has been thanks to new technologies. Now we can emphasize uh, these three uh, turning points for Sanglien de Taul. The original 
remains the original traces, uh, the fact that we can bring back to Taul all what was taken away from it and which was uh, deposited in a, in a museum in Barcelona, and then to recreate uh, the atmosphere of uh, the place. To recreate all of that, thanks to mapping technologies. And these three sequences, these three stages, uh, which in our opinion are so relevant, uh, show the different uh, stages and the different interventions and we can now explain the technique of how to make a fresco i.e. everything revolves around uh, frescoes and the hierarchy of uh, the icons uh, shown in or found in in Taul. In order to recreate the painting and uh, present it, our, our goal was to restore the apps. That meant that given the fact that Romanesque uh, works of art are not only architecture but also art, painting uh, and color, we wanted to rebuild, to reconstruct the paintings. We wanted to rebuild what was pulled out from the walls, so the original one. And this was, uh, we could do that in three stages, but we thought that we could go further than that, to recreate everything that could be reconstructed with scientific knowledge, of course, uh, in the whole church, uh, and go back to what we had in Romanesque times. Uh, Romanesque paintings, uh, it's different from uh, meat post-medieval paintings, sorry, post-Gothic uh, paintings. In Romanesque times, painting was only found in highly coded spaces, not all over the church, as uh, happened in Gothic times. And every space has got its own uh, pace, uh, we could say, painting pace. It's like the reconstruction of, of a, fo a fossil with the set of bones, you can deduct the complexity of the animals. Well, the same thing goes for Romanesque painting. If you have enough uh, painting remains, painting traces, you are able to reconstruct the whole painting, the whole grammar of the language of the paint. So first of all, we decided to document the painting that we had in Manac in the museum in Barcelona. It had some problems. This is the global reconstruction uh, based on how we had decoded each one of the of the sites, especially in Romanesque periods. Uh, the paintings in the apse is has three layers. Uh, first, the lower layer, which is a curtain. In the middle, you have uh, these uh, geometric uh, patterns. Uh, and then the central part, among columns, uh, you have this characters and on the upper part you have this almond or this round area and the painting in this case Christ in majesty and this is how we have redone we have done the reconstruction first of all we had to document each one of the fragments and based on the on the fragments of of the geometrical patterns, uh, we were able to reproduce the whole thing. It was based uh, on uh, some remains uh, from the Lombardy regions, and basically we had to repeat the images as we went along on those on those um, fragments. Uh, then there were also the curtain zone uh, where we had uh, to put a little bit more imagination. But the rest, uh, Albert will explain this. We compared this with other Romanesque paintings, and we very rigorously partly and also creatively uh, and in a very successful way, we were able to complete the images uh, of the whole church. This is a project team and I would like to give the floor now to Albert. Albert or Eloy, I don't know. My task in this project was to do the technical management and technical design for this mapping project. I don't know if you need explanation about what mapping is. I think that you all know about this. And uh, one of the first goals of this project, as Eva well said, was to try and bring together integrate, uh, well, computers, uh, video projectors in this Romanesque area in this Romanesque setting, which is extremely sober 
And uh, the first problem that we had was to include, uh, to, to install the projectors uh, in the church so that uh, the audience would go into the church without realizing that that was a highly technologified uh, setting. We wanted to hide uh, the projectors, and of course we had to install them, but somehow we tried to hide them in as much as possible so that they would not be so visible for visitors. And uh, we looked at the possibilities of uh, any technical installations to be as invisible as possible. This is the presentation, and these are the three basic stages and the three basic concepts uh, that we wanted uh, to work on. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The first one to the left is the current status, i.e., what the church is like at the moment. Uh, here you, we see the deep layers of the original paints after the first restoration. We had to scratch the surface to go back on uh, on uh, to go back to the original remains and to be able to to see the deep layers. Then we have the original in the middle. We have the original pieces, what has remained uh, both in the Barcelona Museum and on site in the church. And to the right, we have the reconstruction of uh, the possible image that would be found uh, in uh, the original times in site and this on, on site. And this is the, the, the image that we have recreated of what it was like in uh, the 12th century. Después, Claro, es que es un atrón ordenador. Aquí. Aquí. Bueno, pero sí, ya voy a explicar la EVA. Eh, la anterior, es que esta es la primera. Así ah, que está en esta. Eh, de alguna manera, eh, un copia ya tenemos el diseño y veiem que es posible proyectar. A... Once we realize that we can project uh, in the apps, and to do that <laughs> with uh, sufficient quality in order to to have the same number of pixels all over the area, all over the place, and with the same light quality. We achieved that with six video projectors, 6,600 lumens, if you're interested in technical details. And in that way, we were able to cover the whole app's uh, surface. We did a 3D scanning with a 3D scanner, which uh, uh, sends out a laser a laser beam generating uh, thousands of points uh, per second. And that's done very quickly. And it generates uh, a virtual geometry in the virtual world, uh, which is very accurately reflecting what the church is like. This was the first step. In order to look at the problems of resolution, uh, when we had uh, to project on this on this space in a very crisp and neat way, we first of all needed to have a good 3D definition of the space we were working in. And that is done thanks to this laser scanner. We then uh, streamlined this complex model, which is uh, heavily loaded with information in order to achieve this 3D model that we could work with. The next stage was uh, uh, the space geometry. We wanted to do something similar with uh, the Barcelona National Museum of Art, where the paintings are, are shown. We took some pictures photographs where we then created a high resolution high definition picture from of the uh, of photograph of the original remains uh, which are shown in the Barcelona Museum. And then we took this photographic, high resolution photographic image and to fit it into this geometry of the site so that the morphology of the paint, of the painting that we have uh, in the museum would fit with uh, the different l layers of the remains that were still found in, on site on the, in the church. The right to the right, you have the 3D model as it is mapped in the 3D world with the textures already applied and uh, the photography uh, incorporated to the whole model. This is the basis for our work. So, first of all, we sorted out the problem in the virtual world. Maybe I'm explaining this in a very silly world way, but we first worked in the, in the virtual world uh, to position projectors and uh, the beams and uh, all the different video layers and the textures and uh, so on. And then we went back to the real world and we were able to fit the virtual world with the real world. Uh, and in that way, we're sorting out the mystery. 
The next part uh, consisted of working with Albert. Albert had to illustrate this, uh, to make an animation. This is a 3D space. It's a uh, convex. Uh, so we have and painting a 3D space in the digital world is complex. So we had to deploy the layer, the texture that stemmed from uh, the muse Barcelona Museum uh, remains, uh, and then to put that in a flat surface so that Alberto would be able to animate this uh, video clip that would be a skin that then would uh, be added to the 3D model and visualizing the different elements of uh, the projectors who could go to back to the real world and to project the, what come, came from the video had to be projected on the church and then to make it fit. There is always a final project, a, a final stage of the project where you need to fit the um, textures. We work with buildings when you do video mapping and details are important, but in this case, the accuracy was much higher because we had pictorial uh, traces that we had to fit to the millimeter. And that, well, included a final stage. Uh, we had the virtual world, we had the real world, we had the video clip, and in a, in a very uh, manual way, we had to fit everything together. We had to bring together this, uh, this skin and the body. This is the layout um, uh, that we used uh, to fit together the pictorial, pictorial structure with uh, the, the template and the reality after some nights working in there. We positioned all the elements in all, in place. We tried to be as accurate as possible, but there are always uh, errors uh, which build up and which require uh, this manual intervention. And this is a bit uh, the layout of uh, where projectors are located. Uh, these are the two views. Uh, Two projectors uh, project on the apps and on the arches on top. They are right below the apps. Uh, there's a hole so that there's enough distance for the projection. Then there are two side projectors. They're crossed. And um, we were lucky enough uh, to have some room for the image to be conveyed there. It was just an issue, a question of a few millimeters. And then on the entrance, we are able to project the lower and the upper part of the apps. This is a result of the technical design that I mentioned at the start. And uh, well, this has been a highly collaborative process. Uh, but once the skin was already deployed, uh, then I give the floor to, I'll give the floor to Albert because that was his continuation, his contribution. Let me mention something else, please. The great difficulty that we found, that Eloy found and was able to, managed to solve, had to do with the fact that in 1920, when uh, the frescoes were pulled out from the, from the walls, they used a technique called strapo. And it's done piece by piece. It's not that they pull everything together, but rather bit by bit. And it's almost like some pieces of a puzzle, what they took out. And then when they went back to the museum in Barcelona before <coughs> 1920, they did that on a surface which was perfect because they had the perfect reproduction of, 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 the, of the location and they had the possibility of playing around with all the different pieces of that puzzle, puzzle to, fit, to make them fit. So the piece that we have in the Barcelona Museum has got some tricks that Eloy then had to, uh, well, work with so that uh, we were able to, to make it fit with the original traces. Actually, the projection that we have uh, now on site reproduces uh, the original much more accurately than uh, what is ex uh, exposed, uh, than, than what is shown in the Barcelona Museum. Uh, just some pieces, not that, it's not major, but some pieces are more accurate. I'll stand, if you allow me. What was my role in this project? I was in charge of uh, digitally restoring all the existing parts 
and to recreate the non-existing parts. So there were several stages to the project. Of course, I was not born in the 12th century, so I had to do my research about how the fresco paintings were, were done at the time. So did, what, what has been digitally recreated has uh, been faithful to that uh, pictorial technique in as much as possible. As Eloy was saying, we took the pictures of the National Museum of Catalonia. These are, well, enormous, huge uh, pictures, and that is the image that I got, okay? It's the Christ in majesty, what he explained. It's the warping that um, deforms the image. So I had to restore all the imperfections uh, caused by the tearing away of the of the painting, etc. So when you put this back into the digital world, the head goes back into place, if you see what I mean. Uh, think of a map. If you want to map out the whole world, the Earth on a map, uh, there's a you, you, you can see the North Pole that is a line, a long line, because it's warped in such a way that the coordinates become become longer. And we uh, well found problems of, of the like. But uh, when you apply it back to the 3D model, it, it goes back to the original morphology. Sorry for the interruption, interruption Albert. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So. Here, you see a zooming in of this uh, restoring process of the, the painting existing at the museum. We eliminated all the cracks, all the imperfections, trying to maintain as much as possible the original paint. So you see here the upper image, that crack that you can see. Well, logically speaking, all the lower part had to be moved upwards and it would fit quite quite all right but in some areas you had to even repaint it pixel by pixel we should say well i just thought of a, show, a joke but maybe it's not it's not appropriate you can tell it's the uh, it's the Christ in Majesty, the Catalan Christ in Majesty because you can see the map of Catalonia there uh, on the heart of the figure. So as we moved on with the restoring process, things were going worse and worse because the Christ was sort of clean, imperfection-wise, but then little by little, well, the whole process got more and more complex. Uh, the pictures were very big, so you could appreciate the details. Maybe you can see it very well here, but we would we would follow the, the, the black profiles, the contours, and fill in the empty, damaged spaces. You see the imperfections here, so there are areas where the damage was quite important. And that is not that bad, believe me, but you see a uh, before and after uh, picture here. At the, at, in the last stage of the mapping is the uh, representation of the whole app's uh, painting. So the idea is for it to look as it had just been painted. Here you see how things become more complex. You see here. You see, in this in this huge pictures, and it's not everywhere, but you could uh, sort of have the intuition. You see the circle around the lamp and the border; those uh, baseboards. These are drafts that we would send. That we would send to. Edward, and then we would argue because, well, he, well, it's, it's, it's what usually happens. So when the paint is 
it's nearly invisible. If you would zoom in, you would find traces of an eye. Not always, but before starting to paint, what we would do is we would maintain that laser image. We knew that uh, that was able uh, with, the, with the suffering to God, with the lamb, so we, we knew that that animal there was, was not a mule, for instance, it was, it was a lamb. And then we would apply color, basic color, which we would, took, which, which we would take from that uh, trace before starting to really paint. So we would sit down and said, discuss it. You know, usually the hands were covered when people present an offering to God, yeah, these things, you know. So we had to discuss all of this, and that is what made the whole restoration possible. And it's uh, another example here. We would do the outline, paint uh, the gaps. And here, St. Clement, precisely, became more complicated. You see all the steps that we had to take with using the pictorial technique applied by the master of Taul. And that first image to the left is the real one. We would amplify it with that giga picture so you see traces and, and, and remnants and you can then use your intuition. Then here, in this case, there were uh, some white stars. You see those dots here. And it's the same kinds of clothes that one of the apostles uh, used to wear. Saint Clement, in this case, uh, would be wearing the same types of clothes as, uh, as the other evangelists. So you need to be, you need to bear in mind that comparing. Comparing in this case is very is usually very successful. There is uncertainty also involved and in some creativity, and that's where we argue the, the most. But still, well, without an argument, it's not that's not working. Then here, I show you another example. It's the same. It's about getting all these uh, outlined until you deduce really the positioning of the characters, etc. Well, this one was difficult because we we only had this and the upper part. Okay, again, let me repeat that we had nothing to work with in the beginning. We we well knew by intuition that there were some angels there because well. It happens, uh, we were, would find the same example in other churches. So we sensed that there would be some angels there, and with the giga pictures, we realized that there were some hands there. Not that much of detail, but there were some hands and elbows. So we would have then four hands and four elbows. And then by knowing the position of the hands and the feet, we sort of sensed the positioning of the angel. Of course, if that was the position of the hands, the head couldn't couldn't be like that, you know. So that's uh, that's what we did in order to recreate the scene. These are the drapings, bottom drapings, and the only the only remnant in the church is that image to your left. But if we compare it with another ma Christ in Majesty, we have this Byzantine um, fabric. But I could go on. Sorry that I interrupted. Yes, no, I, I just went, was about to say that in the middle there were uh, f floral traces, yellowish, quite quite visible. Then the colors, you see this blue and red colors. Well, that was our that was our basic uh, knowledge and then we kept on working 
with flowers and other, and other paintings like this one. Uh, flowers are also used. So there's this, this merging of the invented part, if you wish, and the original traces. Here we have the Virgin and Saint I don't know whom, says the speaker. So you see clearly that in the middle, the lower part of feet is, is clearly made up. And then it had to be merged so that it looked like the same painting. Another important part, we had to repaint the whole the whole Christ so that it could become animated. And I'll tell you I'll tell you why later on. We are running really late, so let me speed up. Picture before and after. Uh, the whole reconstruction, the whole restoration. We have the abs, the lamb, the hand, and the rest of the ensemble, recreation, and painting. Music, should we explain that? Well, maybe just a note. The mapping is audiovisual, of course, so we need to take into account that there's music involved, and it's important. It's not negligible. So we visited a luthier in Vagnolas that works with the medieval instruments, and Santi Villanova, uh, he did a, a research about those instruments and uh, he would recreate the tones, the tunes, the melodies, the ways in which these instruments, these musical instruments could be played. Then what we did was, uh, well, to put it into the computer and with electronic music techniques we generated uh, an instrument that emulates a little bit the functioning of the medieval instrument so it manages to create uh, an atmosphere that resembles the melodies and the tunes at the time we recorded sounds of the valley real sounds of the valley to jazz it up and i think we we need to leave it here well we can show it to you later on is there audio connection for the computer is there a mini jack connection so that we can show it of course, you need to go there, you know. You actually need to visit the church to see that. Otherwise, you can't possibly understand it all. Okay, you can you can play it now with a low volume. You getting the audio? We need more volume, says the speaker. If you wish, maybe whilst we see the projection, we can have some Q&A. Can we have a little more volume, please?
bisbe Espac se sent. No, sí, sí. Qui no es veu, però es va veient com es van... You can't see it now, but it's the first traces, the first brush strokes, really. Here, the color base is applied. It's the same pictorial uh, process, the same technique that the original master would have applied, only that, of course, it's accelerated.
Fem una mica de trampa. Sí. Encara no estava, home. Encara no estava. Well, that was not the end. You actually missed the final part, but it was just for the sake of time. Final part, which is the conclusion of the video, is this uh, part here. We use a white light that uh, unveils the original. So it's the opposite. The mapping so far moves from moves from the original to the current version and here we go back into the beginning it's like a it's like a loop it's like uh, well going back to this world awakening up to the new world and these are these are nothing but um, stone walls so it's about waking the public up from that dream yes a dream i would call it a dream So this white light is not just mere white light, but it actually unveils them, the deeper layers. This is just um, white light that we are projecting. I don't know if I said that, but it's actually a permanent installation. Yes, this is projected there. Uh, uh, on site periodically and the physical status of the apps is actually projected with the original uh, fragments at the museum at the National uh, Art Museum of Catalonia so here we just saw the, the projection well thank you very much it's been great I don't know if there are questions for the speakers otherwise we can have a break. Are there any questions? Doubts? Yes? Clarifications? Yes? Beginning of the speech, and um, I would like to ask you, uh, but you show this uh, video mapping in one day, or maybe something that we can visit every day, we can, uh, I mean, we can have the opportunity to see this if we go there. Okay, is uh, every day is every day. every day, it's approximately every four. Yes. Oh, so it's like a permanent installation, every day it's just running. Okay, so uh, there is uh, um, a permanent staff there with uh, all yeah, the yeah, technologies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. This is Mundar Jamhawi from Jordan. I would just, it's a comment actually, it's not a question, uh, to insist on the importance of such a technique. Uh, I'm the manager of the uh, antiquities of Jordan. We have a lot of archaeological sites and a lot. We have 288 churches related to different periods. <laughs> so in terms of interpretation and uh, giving the right story, the right um, illustrations, such technique will be very useful. What I should say from academic point of view that if we go back to Article 9 from Venice Charter where it says when conjecture begins we should stop and in that time when they say it in 1964 they meant that we need interventions that and we need to avoid irreversibility because any intervention could uh, could uh, could create kind of destruction damage. to the and damage to the uh, physical fabrics where such technique is a pure in non-destructive technique and very helpful very informative and it sends the message clearly to the visitor thank you very much thank you <laughs> well in fact there was a that was a challenge also there was people uh, measuring like the lumen or the, you know, the impact of light, the quantity of light that was 
uh, reaching the wall, and the, and so there was a that was not uh, for free. So we did, they, we did that, but there was some people taking care of considering this. So the projection is not harmful, and they say no. So that's why we I'm not keep on. Yeah, yeah. This is a non yeah, 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 yeah. But we didn't know before, so we have some technician has to come and measure it and say, yeah, okay, it's not harmful. Okay. Okay, sorry, I have an answer, a uh, question as well. Uh, what about the business model behind? Uh, actually, I, I, you told uh, before that these projections are made um, every f 45 minutes yeah. every day. Okay, so uh, what about the visitor experience? Did you measure that? I mean, how, you know, if you improve, you enhance the visitor experience. If you have an increase also of the participation, so let's say let's be practical from a yeah. um, practical point of view so how many visitors then you know now are visiting this uh, this site and about the business model so how you can sustain this after the public uh, let's say money uh, is over so is the visitor paying a ticket when he is entering visiting um, just this free information thanks okay. yeah. the uh, the entrance is six euros before I think was four or three, so they increase a bit the the, the ticket. Uh, and what what I get to know last week is that there's been around forty thousand people coming from from November. Almost, no, twenty three November was the like the premiere, and since then we got well, well not we well, <laughs> they got forty thousand visitors, uh, and. Uh, that's one of the also the main things behind this is a, this is a, like a tourist attraction. So it's behind all the archaeological or the historical or the uh, heritage stuff. It's it was meant to be uh, something that could help the ballet of the Pyrenees to get more people. Uh, one of the Oh, what we get to know is that every, everyone, even the people from the village that was very reactive to it, now they are very pleased. Basically for two things. They saw it and they like it. They understand what we were meant to do. And they have more income on their hotels, restaurants and stuff. So that's like a success at this level too. Uh, sustainability, more or less we make like two changes of lamps every, uh, every year. And I think with the income of the tickets, it's far enough. So it's sustainable at all. We have to see a middle and long term what happens. Because maybe we'll have to change projectors in some years. So, uh, uh, that I, so really there's not a plan for the future what's going to happen. It, right now it's just like a maintenance plan. Like we change lamps, we keep the, the, the quality of the projection at its best. And I think it's, it's going on. So uh, it's running and it's like a success at this level. Of course, I'm not the responsible of the economical plan, just like the technical friend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gracias. 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 Gracias.